Welcome to Phil and Dave's Excellent Adventures. Just Dave here. Today I'm talking about the movie The Creator. This is going to be a spoiler review, so if you are concerned about spoilers and you've not seen the movie yet, I would suggest you go ahead and watch the movie first before you watch this review. So The Creator is Gareth Edwards' newest movie. It's set in the year 2063 in the near future where uh, there was an attack. Um, it's been blamed on AI. Uh, the western part of the world has decided AI should be banned. The eastern part of the world uh, has not. So there's sort of this is chronicling the conflict between most of the United States and uh, what they call New Asia, where um, AI is is allowed to work free. Uh, it follows one man's journey as he um, tries to stop the the AI. Um, so yeah, as far as what I liked about the movie overall, I thought the cast was great. I really liked John David Washington as Joshua. Uh, he's, of course, Denzel Washington's son, but he was good in Tenet and um, uh, well, a bunch of other things he was in. I can't remember right now. Was he in Black Klansman, I think? I don't know. Either way, good actor. He, he did great in this. Um, I was really impressed with uh, Madeline Yuna Voyez as uh, Alfie, the little girl who's on the poster there. She was great. She was amazing. I mean, it's her first movie, first thing she's ever done. Um, and uh, yeah, she not that she has a lot to do. She's mostly just kind of cute and, and occasionally sad, but... She does a great job. It's very, very convincing in it. I love Gemma Chan as uh, Maya Fay, which I always like her. She was uh, Minerva in um, Doctor Strange or in, uh, in uh, Captain Marvel. And she was uh, in Cersei, I think, in um, the other Marvel movie that I don't remember. The Celestials? Eternals. Eternals, yeah. Uh, she's great in this. She's not in it much. Um, just sort of in the beginning and the end. There's some flashbacks and stuff. But yeah, she's always good. I love Ken Watanabe as uh, Harem. He's, again, always good in everything. Uh, Sturgill Simpson really blew me away as Drew. Uh, I, I don't know him very well. I just know he's a country singer. And I think he did a Nirvana cover. So that's the only reason I've even heard of him. But uh, I didn't recognize him in this. I didn't know who he was. I just thought, oh, I like that actor. He, he's pretty cool. Blew me away to find out that's some country music singer who apparently has done some other acting as well. But yeah, he was, I mean, not to say like he was amazing, but not bad at all. I liked him. I liked his character and I liked his portrayal of it. Um, Allison Janney, always amazing. It actually took me a couple minutes to figure out who she was because I'm like, I know that person, but I don't didn't quite recognize her. I think it was the blonde hair or something. But uh, yeah, she's great. As Colonel Howell, this sort of badass, you know, um, officer. And uh, yeah, she she was she was amazing. I loved her in this. And uh, Ralph Ennison as General Andrews is great because that dude has the deepest voice I've ever heard in my entire life. He makes James Remar sound like Kermit the Frog. It is crazy. He's like, yeah, what are we going to do? All right, get him in there now. I'm like, oh, this guy's voice is so deep. It's crazy. Loved it. It was great. Uh, cinematography was amazing throughout. I did not look up the name of the cinematographer, and I should have. Um, so, yeah, I apologize for that. But, uh, yeah, it looks great. Uh, very visual, visually stunning, some really cool shots, some very epic kind of sweeping landscapes and everything. It overall looked really, really good, and I, I really appreciated that. Uh, music is great. Uh, they've got some Radiohead in there. Everything in its right place. Plays in this really cool scene where they're first kind of like floating down and um, doing their their initial, well, not their initial attack, but their their attack in the sort of uh, second act there. Um, and there's some uh, deep purple in there. There's an Argent cover. Uh, hold your head up. Like good stuff. A uh, very like classic kind of. Uh, a, a lot of it was like kind of classic rock. Um, and not necessarily like, super popular stuff. Like the deep purple songs weren't like you know Hush or uh, Highway Star or. Uh, their other big one, uh, Smoke on the Water, is that them? Uh, yeah, it was like some, some kind of you know, deeper cuts, and I appreciated that. I also really like the score. It's by Hans Zimmer, who, of course, is famous for doing all sorts of different scores. Um, I guess most recently he did some of the DC stuff, uh, Justice League, I believe he did that with Junkie XL. Uh, cinematography, oh, I do have it here. Craig, uh, Greg Grieg. Greg F Fraser uh, is his name. He worked on the new Dune movie, uh, The Batman, and Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. Uh, with Oren Soffer, who also has a cinematography credit on this, um, which you don't usually see two cinematographers. I think it was a scheduling thing, maybe, that um, Grieg <laughs> wasn't available, so they got Oren to fill in for him. Um, I thought the effects, the, the special effects, the visual effects in this um, were amazing. I, I was really blown away by the fact that, for the most part, it it all looked real. There was maybe one or two scenes where I'm like, well, it could be a little bit better, but for the most part, it just... Everything in this looked just amazing, just perfect. Now, granted, if I watch it a second time, I might notice some stuff. But as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to VFX, the main thing is I don't want it to pull me out of the movie. And so as long as it's good enough for me to not go, oh, that's a fake fire, or that's a fake explosion, or that's CGI, 
then I'm good. And this is great. And I, I think uh, probably the thing I'm impressed about most of the movie is the visual effects. I also really like the design and the aesthetic that they had for a lot of the futuristic vehicles and and the cities and the, the technology and everything. You see uh, Alfie there's got the kind of hole in her head. All of the um, simulants have that. And uh, yeah, I thought it was cool. I really, really like the overall look and design of this. It had a nice mixture of being like futuristic and, and uh, sci-fi, but not too polished. It also looked very worn and used and uh, very tangible like like something that people actually would use um i was also really surprised by the humor there's a lot of pretty good humor in this i thought um a lot of it's from alfie there's one where uh, i think uh, joshua first introduces her to sturgill simpson's character i think and uh, he's like this is my friend he's an asshole and she's like hi asshole very cute very funny uh there's another part where she's like oh yeah me and josh will play this game called stay away from the fucking police and it's just something about having a little girl swear i think it's just very funny and effective and it works just like little cute things saying like messed up stuff always good um i really really liked the uh, the world building in this I, I thought it was it felt like a very lived in very realistic world i think they did a very good job of explaining kind of the exposition behind it and what had happened and why the world was the way that it is um but also like i would definitely love to see more movies set in this world I don't think there will be, but I would, I would see him. I would definitely watch him. I really also liked about this movie that it was not based on any existing IP. Um, it's not an adaptation of a comic book or, or a TV show or a remake or a reboot of an old movie. Granted, it, it certainly ha has some influences, <laughs> but uh, it, for the most part, it, it is essentially an, an original IP. Um, so that's cool. I really like it. Anytime there's a new movie that comes out, I'm always excited to see, especially it seems like sci-fi does it a lot. Uh, and it's always frustrating when people complain that like all Hollywood does is, you know, make re make reboots and remakes and like nothing's original anymore. And it's like, well, something original comes out and nobody goes to see it. So what do you expect? Um, I really like the story. I particularly liked uh, the, the stuff about the LA attack and how they explained it. I also really enjoyed that for me, at least in the beginning of the movie, I fully sided with Joshua and the humans in the Western part of the world. And I'm even like thinking, oh, yeah, that would be me. If, if I lived in this world, I would be one of the soldiers who was going to stop that AI man because you got to stop him, you know. And then as the movie goes on, of course, pretty early, you can tell there's some nuance to that and that maybe AI isn't completely bad. But then as it goes on, you find out that, yeah, AI isn't bad at all. And humans are actually the ones who are, who are wrong. And it was actually human error that caused the attack in L.A. that started this whole thing. And uh, th there's a part where the, the robot gets targeted and he sees there's a group of people huddled over. So the robot doesn't want to hurt them. So they the robot runs away and, and keeps the people safe and protects them. And then just a few minutes later, we show Alice and Janney um, sending robots in to die. And the robot's like, what is my order? And like, go, run. And the robot's like, they honor serving you. And it takes off and just explodes. This robot's whole purpose is to explode and to hurt people and to kill people or simulants, I suppose. But uh, yeah, and I just like that juxtaposition and realizing like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, no, they're, these guys are definitely the bad guys here. And just for me, the, the slow realization that like, oh yeah, no, not only is, this, is there more nuance to this than I thought, but no, the guys that we thought were the good guys are actually the bad guys. I really like that. And I really like the ending too. Uh, as far as what I didn't like about the movie, um, Joshua, the character has plot armor a mile thick. <laughs> He's able to make it through some crazy stuff. And it'd be granted, he, he's missing an arm and a leg, so stuff happened. But he, he kind of starts the movie missing an arm and leg, I'm pretty sure. I think that happened before the explosion, right? I don't remember anymore. Either way, though, uh, yeah, the guy goes through some stuff where I'm like, man, I, I can't believe he's going to make it. Oh, he's fine. No, he's good. Go. There's even a point toward the end there where um, the robot's grabbing him and stuff. And I'm like, okay, if he makes it through this, this is bullshit, man. Like, come on. And he, he kind of did, but he did. He, he does end up um, not making it in the end. Um, I, I was a little confused as to why Joshua's character wouldn't have become sympathetic to the simulants earlier, considering that uh, his wife was raised by simulants and she was obviously very sympathetic. I, I know he was undercover and all that, blah, blah, blah. But you would think he would have started to turn a little bit sooner. He would have started to see the way that these simulants treat people and the fact that his wife said they treated her better than people ever did. You'd think stuff like that would start to get him, you know, the wheels turned a little bit sooner than, than they did. Um, and there, there's there's a number of, uh, of plot holes in this. Now, not all of them are plot holes. Some of them might just be things that I missed or I didn't understand and just weren't really explained. But I think the, the one, the biggest one for me that I just can't really come up with an ex explanation for is there's a part where he and Alfie are running. They're in a truck. The battery dies or something. And then they find some random people to help them. And these people help them. Uh, I don't understand why those people would help. They didn't know them. They never met him before. They had no reason to help him. And I mean, okay, fine. You meet some stranger. He's got a cute little kid. Uh, you should give him a ride. 
that's that's un understandable. But when they get to the checkpoint and the guy's like lying for him and saying like, oh, this is my sister's kid and like all that kind of stuff. That's where I'm like, OK, I, I try. That. And then like the guards start shooting at them and the guy like drives away. Or I think Alfie kind of makes the car drive away. Um, and I'm like, OK, yeah, but these people don't know them at all. Why would they do this? And then also, what were those lasers actually doing? Because they shot at their car multiple times with those lasers and they didn't appear to do any kind of damage whatsoever. So I'm like, what? What do these lasers only harm organic matter or something? That doesn't make any sense. So I'm like, what? What's going on here? That was just weird. They're like shooting him with these lasers and hitting him, and like nothing is happening. So I'm like, what? What do those lasers do? <laughs> they, they just, they just, just light? I, I don't, I don't know. Um, there's also a part of the end where they storm the Nomad, which has a cool design. I really like to look at that ship. But he's kind of like in between these big things that are moving around and i'm watching it going like oh god if that were me i'd be worried those things are gonna chop my head off or like you know slice off a limb or something but apparently he knew the layout of the the nomad how did he know this i don't know and they might have mentioned it it might have had somewhere in the movie where it's like oh i helped design that or I, I worked there i've been there that's very possible but to me it just seemed like man he seems to know a lot about this thing like was he the designer did he work there i, I don't understand um why do the simulants have a standby or an off switch in, in their brain i mean i understand when humans design why they would do that but you would think the sims would have figured out a way to bypass that or or to not do that or if they were making their own sims they wouldn't put it there i mean granted it's a good idea and if we build robots we should definitely have an off switch but i just i don't understand why why the robots would allow themselves to be turned off so easily and then like why do they have to sleep i mean i guess maybe they're recharging their batteries or something but you know, there's a scene where ken watanabe has a little girl and yeah uh joshua just walks up and like turns it off and you're like Oh, okay. Um, well, that's convenient. It worked out well for you. Uh, there's another thing, too, that they show early on the simulator. like, no, please don't kill me. They're like, it's just programming. It's just programmed. They don't feel anything. Why did they program them that way then? It, it just reminds me of like the Simpsons episode where like there's a robot on fire. He's like, why was I programmed to feel pain? And it's like, yeah, you don't, you don't need to do that. I mean, I guess you do so that they don't hurt their bodies or because it's AI, it's natural. They would also feel pain or something. I'm sure there's a reason they can explain, and I would like to think that the, the filmmakers thought about this stuff before, and they may have even explained it, I just missed it. But these are just some questions where I'm like, I don't, okay, what, what, what's going on? <laughs> and then I'm fairly sure when he finally discovers his wife, um, Gemma Chan's character, who is now Nimrata, uh, she's been on like life support for five years or something like that. And he's like, well, why don't you unplug him? And the guy's like, why don't you unplug her? And, and uh, Ken Watanabe, I think, or somebody, he's like, well, we couldn't. Um, and then my take on that was like, oh, yeah, because robots can't harm humans, you know. And then they did explain the L.A. thing was actually a human error. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, so the robots really haven't done anything wrong here at all. And then I'm like, no, <laughs> they have. They they shot sticky bombs on people. Right. Unless were those different robots. Is there a difference between like the robot looking robots and like the simulant looking robots? And can they do it? Or was that maybe a person that did it? And not a robot that did it or a sim. I, I don't remember. And I, I was just a little confused by that where I'm like, okay, so what's what's going on here? Um, so yeah. Uh, other than that, the movie is directed by Gareth Edwards, not to be confused with Gareth Evans. Uh, Gareth Edwards directed Monsters, uh, the Godzilla movie from uh, 2016 or so, I think, uh, a few years back, and uh, Rogue One, Star Wars story. Um, Gareth Evans did the raid. Uh, <laughs> uh, the movie was written by uh, Gareth Edwards and Chris Weitz. Chris White uh, wrote about a boy um, and Rogue One with Tony Gilroy, but he he got to start writing American Pie with I think his brother Paul, um, which is just funny to me that they, the guys who wrote American Pie, one of them at least, has gone on to do some pretty highly regarded stuff. Um, at one point in the movie, they wanted Danny McBride and Benedict Wong. Uh, they weren't able to do it for probably scheduling reasons. Uh, Danny McBride was replaced with Sturgill Simpson, Benedict Wong with Ken Watanabe. Uh, would have been interesting with them in there. Uh, there was a little controversy over this movie because the trailer uh, used footage from the actual Beirut explosion in 2020. Um, when it came out and there's people, you know, noticed it and got upset. The director, Gareth Edwards, came out and said, hey, he apologized. It was a previous shot they had used before the movie was done, which is fairly common for movies to use from what I understand. And they did take that shot out of the movie before the movie was actually released. Um, and according to him and, and everyone involved, it wasn't supposed to be in the, the trailer that was released. OK, uh, I did think um, that uh, th there was definitely some stuff with uh, this movie that, that is very relevant to today, specifically all the stuff with AI, because, I mean, currently we've got a uh, an actor strike going on and they just ended the writer strike or it's almost over. But a lot of that had to do with AI. It's a definitely a very major modern concern and something that a lot of people are, um, you know, worried about, understandably. 
And I think uh, that maybe in some ways this movie, I think some people who didn't like this movie may have been upset at the fact that AI is kind of the good guys, or at least not the bad guys. And they're like, no, AI, they're taking our jobs, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, I think there was also a scene where one of the robots, and when I say robot, I mean, there's some that look just straight up like robots. There's just one guy who's got a cool design with these kind of mandible kind of mouth and, and jaws going on. He was in one of the posters, but he's not in this one. Uh, and I swear there's a scene where it looks like he's smoking. And I'm like, wait, what is that? <laughs> I don't understand. Ro robots smoke? Maybe I just I saw it wrong or something, but I swear they're like sitting around like a campfire or something. And I swear it looks like he like takes something and exhales. And I'm like, what What even is that? Or was that not a robot? Was that a person in a costume? I don't know. I, 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 I was, uh, that was confusing. <laughs> um, I think, <laughs> like I said, the movie is technically an original uh, piece of work, but it definitely has a lot of influences. Uh, it reminds me a lot of District 9, especially in the design and the look. Uh, Ex Machina, definitely with the whole AI thing. Robots, Terminator, Terminator 2 especially. Uh, Apocalypse Now, I think Gareth Edwards uh, said directly that that movie was an inspiration. Remind me a little bit of um, like Moon Wolf and Cobb and Mandalorian and all those type things where there's you know an older guy, Logan, an older guy leading a child through a thing. It also remind me a little bit of the movie 65, which uh, the Adam Driver movie with Dinosaur stories that came out earlier this year that nobody liked but i kind of did so i don't know just interesting I, I think particularly the ending was kind of a similar type of ending where i'm like oh this is pretty similar to the 65 ending like okay hmm. um, or the setup at least uh yeah so this one rotten tomatoes uh critics are like it but don't love it uh when i first saw it, it was at 67 now it's at 68 percent uh the audience is, is a little more forgiving audience is at 78 percent I'm um, just reading through some of the uh, reviews, just the, the quick like little blurbs. It seems like the critics who didn't like it, their issue was it was just too familiar, it, too too much like other movies they had seen before um, and a little too formulaic. And I think some of them were a little concerned about the, the AI not being bad. And then even in the, the uh, Rot Rotten Tomatoes description, it says something about the movie not being, um, you know, being pretty surface level or not being very deep or anything like that, which... You know, I, I don't know that I agree. Now, it's very possible. I'm just not that smart. Or the, these people have seen more movies. I'm sure they have. Or are a little more clever than I am, a little more savvy. But I also think it's possible that maybe they, they missed some stuff. Because I think there was some nuances in there. Like I said, the stuff with the robots uh, hurting people and all that, that I thought was pretty interesting and that I actually really enjoyed. And again, the, the idea that from the beginning of the movie, I was totally on Joshua and the human side. And by the end of the movie, I was totally on the AI side. Um I don't know. I mean, maybe it would have been a little more nuanced or, or a, perhaps a better or a, a more complicated movie, a more complex movie, if if there there were there weren't a clear good guy or bad guy. And I will say I've always kind of liked that. And I've always thought I want to see a movie like that or I want to make a movie like that. And there have been some. But, yeah, often it seems like when there's a conflict between two sides, there's one one group is bad. One group is good. And I've always I always kind of like the idea that that's not really how it is, not even in real life. I mean, granted, Nazis are pretty bad, but uh, for the most part, you know, there, there's good guys and bad guys on both sides. And I would like to see something that's portrayed a little bit more even handed where you can kind of see like you can kind of relate to both sides of the of the debate. Um, Black Panther did that pretty well, I think. I think the Warcraft movie kind of did that. There, there's been, I'm sure, tons of movies over the years that have done that, especially war movies. But uh, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, so as far as a budget goes on this, like I said, I was really impressed with the visual effects to the point where, like, you know, it's someone in the movie. I'm like, holy shit, how much money did they spend? Did they spend like 200, 250 million on this freaking movie? Because if they did, there's no way they're making that money back. And then they're going to complain. But no, $80 million, which is an insane amount of money and more money than I will ever see in my entire life. But relatively a, a small amount of money for a, a big budget movie like this. And I think I read an interview with Gareth Edwards where he said he was sort of embarrassed that they spent that much on it. They probably, he thought could have done it for cheaper. This definitely is a much lower budget than Rogue One or Godzilla, which were over a hundred million each, I think. But uh, yeah, I appreciate that. And I appreciate they were able to do it, you know, sort of on the cheap. And I, I don't think they had to pay much for actors, John David Washington, Gemma Chan, uh, Ken Watanabe aren't exactly household names. So they probably got them for, a little cheaper than, you know, they would have had to pay for some. But yeah, uh, as far as, uh, you know, how much it's made so far, it's made about 32 million worldwide, uh, 14 million domestic, which is a little under figures. But, you know, with the writer strike uh, still going on and the actor strike also still going on, the writer strike is almost over. They couldn't promote it. They couldn't go to Comic-Con. They can't go on late night talk shows and talk about it or anything like that. So uh, it's probably a little bit of, of why they, um, you know, didn't do as well as they hoped. But they'll have to make $160 million to break even. Maybe it can. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not an expert, but I do think it's a good movie. I actually think it's probably my favorite movie of the year so far. Um, and so as far as my score goes on this one, I'm going to give it a nine out of 10. I thought it was great. Not perfect. There's definitely some issues and 
some plot holes that you could probably drive a truck through. But overall, I like the story. I love the performance and the ending with the kid and the pod and everything. I mean, Jesus, the kid's crying, he's crying, I'm crying, everybody's crying. It was great. Uh, not a dry on the house at that point, at least for me. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's my score, 9 out of 10. I thought it was great. Probably my favorite movie of the year so far. But if you saw it, let me know what you thought of it down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you have a great night. And I will see you here again next week. Oh,